Batman is one of the most recognizable and popular characters of all time, but he's also the poster boy for reinvention. Throughout his 80 years of existence, nowhere is this more apparent than the film adaptations. From Adam West to Michael Keaton, Joel Schumacher to Zack Snyder. Yet after the disaster of Batman and Robin, it took multiple failures to revive the prized property, until Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins restored the Dark Knight from the shadow of its former self. It was a decade's worth of a guano show. A shit show. Uh, meant to say shit show. Created in 1939 by Bill Finger, and only named by a complete fraud, Batman instantly became a comic icon. It only took four years before it was adapted into a 15-part film serial. Being that it was 1943, it was mainly anti-Japanese propaganda and super racist, but it was the first time Batman was on the big screen. His popularity continued to soar, especially in ABC's Batman from 1966. Starring Adam West as the Cape Crusader, the producers weren't exactly versed in the comics, choosing to make the TV show outright slapstick. Will Batman and Robin stew in their own juice? That sounds risky. Risk is our business, Mr. Wayne. Of course. Batman, I have the same faith in you that all of Gotham City has. The series was such a colossal success, a movie was ordered, filmed, and released in four months. Batman the movie was the first official film for the character. However, he was anything but the Dark Knight. One way six ounces sits in a tree and is very dangerous. A sparrow with a machine gun. Yes, of course. DC Comics tried to shed that goofy depiction for over 20 years but wasn't able to until Frank Miller's groundbreaking The Dark Knight Returns in 1986. It established that comics weren't just for kids. They could tackle real adult themes. Violent and political, it proved that mainstream audiences could see Batman in a different light. The novel directly inspired Tim Burton's vision for 1989's Batman, a gothic action adventure with Michael Keaton under the cape and cow that filmgoers devoured. It became the fifth highest grossing movie of all time and reportedly sold half a billion dollars in merchandising. Get those wonderful toys. The world became consumed by Batmania. Batman became the crown jewel of DC Comics and a financial pillar for Warner Brothers. Two years later came the award-winning and all-around amazing animated series to keep that gravy train running. Though Warner Brothers did botch the release of the highly regarded Mask of the Phantasm by rushing its production and failing to market it. Then Batman Returns happened. We've discussed the fallout of Burton's operatic yet borderline BDSM sequel before. Just the pussy I've been looking for. But in short, it offended so many parents and made almost a hundred million less than the first that Warner Brothers handed the bat keys to Joel Schumacher. I remember toying with the idea of doing another one, and I remember going into Warner Brothers and half hour into the meeting, I go, you don't want me to make another one, do you? And they go, oh, no, 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 no. And I, and I, I just said, no, I just, I said, we just stopped it right there. <laughs> Gravitating towards the splashy comics of the 40s and 50s, Schumacher envisioned elaborate sets, big performances, colorful everything, laundry karate, and joygasms? Joygasm! <laughs> Batman Forever was the biggest film of 1995. Schumacher felt he'd made what Warner Brothers asked for, and petitioned to make a sequel in the vein of The Dark Knight Returns. The studio said the contrary, wanting him to lean into that theatrical glow stick style. Everyone re-upped for another round, aside from Val Kilmer as Batman, being replaced by that handsome doctor from ER. Warner Brothers was so convinced of Batmania 2.0, they paid Arnold Schwarzenegger $25 million to star as Mr. Freeze, and allowed toy manufacturers to weigh in on designs and story. The merchandising and licensing became a very, very important part of the making of the film. But I also have to say, I was an adult, I was awake, and I went along with it. So I'm not pointing a finger at anyone else and saying, they made me do this. Although Schumacher would eventually express extreme regret over his involvement in 1997's Batman and Robin, then he called it the most fun job in the world and loved that he wasn't limited by reality police. 
Warner Brothers were thrilled with what Schumacher had shown them during production. And two weeks after Batman and Robin wrapped, they hired Mark Protosevich to write a fifth installment. Warner Brothers was thinking Scarecrow for the next baddie, or classics like Mad Hatter, King Tut, and Egghead. Get on the back of my Batgirl cycle and show me where your hideout is. I'm that thing, but I might be extinguished. Batman Triumphant, a title the internet completely made up, was actually called Batman Unchained, and it tied the previous four films into one go-for-broke showstopper. Dr. Jonathan Crane, a.k.a. Scarecrow, was out to destroy Bruce Wayne, and Harley Quinn was after Batman, seeking revenge for the death of her father, Joker? You sure as hell didn't f***ing create me, Puddin'. Yeah, well, I named you. You got Harley Quinn out of Harleen Quinzel? Nice work, genius. <laughs> the studio was thinking Madonna or Courtney Love for Harley, and Jeff Goldblum or Howard Stern for Scarecrow. Though, according to Coolio, he was promised the role for doing his uneventful cameo in Batman and Robin. But Schumacher personally asked Nicolas Cage to put on the burlap sack. Are you sure? Yeah, I think I want to have a go at Egghead. I think I can make him absolutely terrifying. And I have a concept for Egghead. It all led to the jaw-dropping climax of Batman trapped in Arkham Asylum, hallucinating a trial put on by all his past villains played by all the same actors. Danny DeVito's Penguin, Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman, Tommy Lee Jones's Two-Face, Jim Carrey's Riddler, and Warner's ace in the hole, Jack Nicholson's Joker. The studio was in talks with each of the stars, with Nicholson even teasing the possibility while doing press for as good as it gets. The final shot was Batman in a cave engulfed in a swarm of bats, conquering fear itself. Schumacher gushed over the risk of it being the most expensive movie ever made. Aiming for a release in 1999, Warner Brothers was understandably excited about the film's potential. There was just one problem. Batman and Robin came out. All right, everyone, chill. Right off the, um, bat, Batman and Robin was instantly considered one of the worst films ever. It opened just as strong as the others and was in no way a historic bomb. Hell, it made $125 million from all those toys alone. But with dismal reviews and deadly word of mouth, it barely crawled to $100 million in the U.S. To be fair to Schumacher... To be fair... To be fair... To be fair... He made a Batman for all ages that harkened back to the very popular Adam West era. In that sense, holy camp, Batman! Schumacher hit the nail on the head. Louder, come on, sing, sing, sing! I need a sign. How about slippery when wet? With scenery-chewing performances and a big, dopey heart. But none of that can excuse bad acting. You're about to become compost. Unfunny gags. Never leave the cave without it a clear ploy to sell more toys, and like the films before it, sidelining Batman himself. As for the bat nipples, that dead horse is well and truly beat, but it does encapsulate Warner Brothers' dubious decisions with Batman. Seeing as Forever was a bounce back from returns, financially, Warner Brothers had no reason to believe that Batman and Robin would be so roundly rejected. If there's anybody watching this that loved Batman Forever, and went into Batman and Robin with great anticipation. If I, if I disappointed them in any way, then I really want to apologize, because it wasn't my intention. My intention was just to entertain them. Schumacher was eager to work with his cast again, especially Clooney, who he called the best and most mature Batman. For Clooney, he felt he didn't crack his portrayal and desired another chance to prove himself. Instead, Batman Unchained was put on ice. Tim Burton's twisted quasi-kink aesthetic angered parents, and Joel Schumacher's jokey neon Vegas sideshows were an affront to fans, Warner Brothers was at a loss on how to continue. Unchained died after Schumacher decided not to return, and Clooney started his never-ending apology tour. Didn't you apologize to the crowd at Comic-Con for Batman and Robin? I always apologize for Batman. <laughs> but, you know, I thought at the time this was going to be a very good career move. Um... It wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't a very good Batman. I was, I'm the first one to say it. But, um, but if it's good for drinking games, then that's worth something. There's something salvaged out of that mess. 
I met uh, Adam West back there just now, and I was like, hey, I'm really sorry. <laughs> Warner Brothers hired Iron Giant screenwriter Tim McCanleys to explore reviving Batman via a TV series. He plotted out an entire run following a globe-trotting Bruce Wayne as he learns his various skills. One episode, titled Smallville, had Wayne meet a young Clark Kent. Out of everything McCanleys wrote, that was the one idea Warner Brothers ran with. Obviously being spun off into the series Smallville, where they weren't allowed to ever have a Batman cameo. Birds of Prey was... a, a show. A short-lived attempt to spin off Batman's surrounding family. In their broad brainstorming, Warner Brothers looked to their animated wing. Batman the Animated Series and its relaunch, The New Batman Adventures, finished in 1999. Then it evolved into the wholly original Batman Beyond. Not based on any comic book run, the series followed an elderly Bruce Wayne mentoring a new Batman in a super future Gotham City. It was a stark contrast to any Batman before, and Warner Brothers explored adapting it into the next feature. Hot off Remember the Titans, director Boya Zakin came in to develop Beyond. In a smart move, Yakin partnered with Beyond's creators, Paul Dini and Alan Burnett. Yakin visualized the Blade Runner of Batmans, casting Clint Eastwood as Bruce and pressing for a hard R film. But he really wanted to work on it with, with Alan and myself. So we had a number of meetings with him. We actually all worked on a draft together. I mean, it was fine. It, it, it wasn't like this. It was set in the in Gotham future, but it didn't quite have the uh, fantastic futuristic edge the project only existed for a few months. After a first draft was turned in, Yakin came to the conclusion that he wasn't passionate about it and walked. Now I'll have to start all over again. Thanks for wrecking everything, kid. See you around. Then there was the mostly unheard of script, Batman Dar Knight. Oh, Dark Knight. Two writers with little to no credits, Lee Shapiro and Stephen Wise, happened to be at Warner Brothers meeting about something else when Batman's unknown future came up during conversation. Shapiro and Wise, on the spot, pitched a return to the franchise's darker roots, with Batman uncovering the mystery of the Man-Bat. The two were given a shot, supplying a script three months later. With Clooney and Chris O'Donnell still under contract, the story had Professor Jonathan Crane testing his fear toxins on inmates of Arkham Asylum and accidentally creating the Man-Bat. Scarecrow is a physical and lethal foe, with multiple terrifying kills, and the film ends with all of Arkham breaking out, setting up sequels with Harley Quinn, Killer Croc, and Clayface. The script was considered on and off for over two years before being scrapped, when Warner Brothers made the unheard of decision to ditch all continuity for a sequel. The four Batman movies largely relegated the title character to the background. Burton and Schumacher both admitted that they enjoyed the vibrant rogues gallery much more. Perhaps the answer was making Bruce Wayne interesting for once. Around 2000-2001, Warner Brothers started holding an open call for anyone who had ideas on how to fix the Batman. Joss Whedon pitched a small-scale origin that was more Silence of the Lambs than anything else. And comic writer Grant Morrison wrote a treatment about Bruce training around the world where he never puts on the cowl. Neither went anywhere. Darren Aronofsky and the Wachowskis both suggested adapting Frank Miller's Batman Year One. The comic was Miller's follow-up to The Dark Knight Returns and details the first year of both Batman and James Gordon in Gotham City. It would be the perfect way to start over. Aronofsky, whose only major credit at that point was his uber low-budget indie pie, wanted to see the polar opposite of Schumacher's films. His pitch alluded to 70s thrillers like Death Wish and The French Connection, calling Gordon the Serpico of Gotham City, and Batman its Travis Bickle. Maybe it was crazy enough to work. With the Wachowskis moving to the Matrix sequels, Warner Brothers paired Aronofsky with Frank Miller himself to write it. They worked together effortlessly, and Miller loved that Aronofsky would push the violence further than he ever would, plus show the physical toll crime fighting would take on the human body. By the time they were done, the screenplay was more inspired by Year One than a straight adaptation, and nearly reinvented the character from the ground up. Bruce rejects the Wayne fortune after his parents' murder, instead becoming a mechanic under the tutelage of Big Al. He witnesses the underworld's lowest levels of depravity watching a nearby cat house, and it's a stirring televised speech from Lieutenant Gordon that galvanizes him to become a vigilante. For Batman, Aronofsky wanted an actor with underlying darkness, like Joaquin Phoenix. Are you sure? 
Warner countered with Freddie Prinze Jr. Aronofsky quickly realized he and the studio would never see eye to eye. When Warner Brothers finally read their borderline nihilistic script, they were shocked. Proto-Batman wearing a Jason-like hockey mask while beating goons into pulp. Mistress Selina being abused by a dirty cop. Gordon introduced on the toilet with a gun in his mouth debating suicide. Darkness. It's about how I'm an orphan. No. Even though this was what Aronofsky said he would write, it was still too far for Warner Brothers. Every attempt to get him to pull it back, he'd dig in further. At the beginning of 2002, Warner Brothers and Aronofsky parted ways. I think Warner's always knew it would never be something they could make. I think rightfully so, because four-year-olds buy Batman stuff. But there was a hope at one point that there might be a way of doing the movies at different levels. Say, that's for kids, and this one's for adults. Warner Brothers was very brave in allowing us to develop it, and Frank and I were both really happy with the script. An early consideration for Batman was Christian Bale. He was not a fan of the character until he was ironically given year one. He heard about Aronofsky's project, but by the time he reached out to audition, it was no more. Unlike Marvel, who before Disney, sold the rights to their characters and their adaptations were at the whims of those studios, Warner Brothers owns DC Comics outright. So any fault fell squarely on their shoulders. And they let not only Batman crash and burn after four films, but Superman as well. Superman 4 being a particular embarrassment. And they were the only company in town making superhero movies. When Alan Horn became president and COO of Warner Brothers, he made sure both properties were absolute priorities. He met with Wolfgang Peterson, director of Air Force One and The Perfect Storm, about handling a new Superman movie, where he suggested having the hero face off with Batman. Warner Brothers loved the idea and sent him into his own corner to develop it with Andrew Kevin Walker, screenwriter of Seven. Walker was instructed to write the film like it would be nominated for Academy Awards. And Peterson sought serious actors, not action stars. And Colin Farrell was the frontrunner for Batman. Are you sure? Whoa, take it easy, sweetheart. For Superman, Peterson leaned towards Josh Hartnett and Christian Bale, while Warner was ready to sign Jude Law. In the summer of 2002, Batman versus Superman was officially a go. The versus comes from the two heroes' ideological dispute over killing the Joker, and it culminates in Superman allowing Batman to do so, but if he does, he can't hide behind his mask. Walker's draft was incredibly dark and existential at times, so Warner Brothers, strangely, hired Akiva Goldsman to tone it down. The same man who wrote Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. I'm Batman. Falling back into old habits, Goldsman added lots of over-the-top dialogue and toy-friendly images. <laughs> Walker's script has never been released, but Goldsman's has been circling the internet for years, so it's unknown who added what. But the plot twist of Lex Luthor brainwashing a woman to be the perfect wife to Bruce, then cloning the Joker to kill her on their honeymoon was... It was terrible. It was a terrible idea. I'd like that last statement stricken from the record, please. Record? Is someone supposed to be writing this down? Batman vs. Superman's fate was ultimately tied to the revival of Superman. Getting another solo Superman feature off the ground was its own saga and a story for another time. But long story short, Peterson's film was racing against Superman Flyby, to be directed by McGee and written by J.J. Abrams. Alan Horn was split on which movie should go forward. In an unusual move, he handed out both screenplays to 12 of his executives to hold a vote. Not even a year after 9-11, the executives felt maybe what the world needed now was a Superman. Only one of the 12 voted for Batman vs. Superman. Barely a few months after the film was greenlit, it was dead. As a consolation prize, Peterson was given the Iliad epic, Troy. And Warner Brothers, in a panic, fast-tracked Catwoman. A project originally intended as a spin-off for Michelle Pfeiffer that languished in development hell until the Halle Berry version was produced. The ill-advised box office bomb shares nothing in common with the comic character, other than the name, and the cat dragged in worse reviews than Batman and Robin. 
At the end of 2002, director Christopher Nolan was at a loss for his next project. His planned Howard Hughes biopic stalled when Martin Scorsese's version took off. His agent called me and said, Warners is looking to make another Batman film, and I just mentioned it in passing, and I, I didn't think that was anything for you, right? <laughs> and he was like, no, that's really exciting, because I've always thought there was a Batman story that hasn't been told on film. Having just made the well-received noir insomnia for them, Warner Brothers was interested in what Nolan had to say. His pitch was short, concise, and seemed to say everything they wanted to hear. Do for Batman what Richard Donner did for Superman in 1978. Make an old Hollywood epic with a detailed origin story, film in real cities, fill the cast with Oscar-caliber talent, and finally, the real kicker for Warner Brothers, make something the 10-year-old Nolan would have wanted to see. He had no issue with making a PG-13 film. The darkness would come from conflict, not violence. He made his case in less than 15 minutes. He walked out of the room and the executives all agreed this was the idea and the guy they've been waiting for. Again, given his own corner to work in, Warner Brothers had one request. Please include a Batmobile. Whether that was for toy purposes or just because of tradition. Fascinated by the psychology of Bruce Wayne, but not being an extreme comic nerd, Nolan enlisted David Goyer to help flesh out a possible story. Even though he was busy with Blade Trinity, it was a dream project for the Batman fanatic. So Goyer found the time to co-write the first draft. While the genesis of why Bruce Wayne becomes Batman is like a Bible story at this point, the how has been more of a mystery. The origin story had never been addressed on, on film or really even in the comics. Uh, that is to say, there isn't really a single definitive account of, of uh, the journey of Bruce Wayne into Batman. So there are sort of fascinating gaps in the mythology there to be played with. Pulling from the long Halloween, the man who falls, and of course, year one, Batman Begins was all about Bruce Wayne. How he learned his skills, why he cares for Gotham City, why he chooses to be a vigilante. As a man, I'm flesh and blood, I can be ignored, I can be destroyed, but as a symbol, as a symbol, I can be incorruptible, I can be everlasting. Where he gets all his wonderful toys, why he wears a cape, and, for the first time in all the previous projects, made and unmade, why he dresses like a bat. Why bats, lost the way? Bats frightened me. This time my enemies shared my dread. Nolan Goyer and production designer Nathan Crowley spent the summer of 2003 in Nolan's garage debating every detail of the movie. While Goyer and Nolan wrote, Crowley commissioned concept art and built models of Gotham City and the new Batmobile, the Tumblr. Once finished, they had the Warner executives come to Nolan's garage to read the script and force them to be immersed in their vision. It worked. The project became the first Batman film to be put into production since 1997. Nolan sat with every Hollywood heartthrob for Batman, and all of them said they weren't interested in following Clooney's fate, including Heath Ledger. Are you sure? I thought my jokes were bad. Nolan had to convince them that this time, Bruce Wayne would be a character study, as Batman wouldn't show up until an hour in. They screen tested Killian Murphy, Jake Gyllenhaal, Joshua Jackson, and surprise, Nolan's first choice, Christian Bale. American Psycho was a great selling point for Bale, playing a very disturbed individual with dual identities, who also murders the Joker. Hey, Paul! Yet his most recent, very emaciated role was The Machinist. For Warner Brothers to seriously consider him, Nolan needed Bale to regain 60 pounds in six weeks before his audition, which he aced and was cast shortly after. But once production was nearing, he bulked up a little too much. I took Chris at his exact word about get as big as you can, but he didn't really think I was going to get that big. And a number of the crew, they looked at me and they were like, bloody hell, Chris, what are we doing here? Fat man or Batman? And uh, so I realized, okay, uh, <laughs> that's not what he had meant. So I had to then try and lose a lot of weight. Filming was set to start in March of 2004 in Iceland. However, the frozen lake they had scouted months before was in danger of completely thawing out. 
They jump-started production weeks early, spent one day shooting as much of a sword fight as feasible, and returned the next day to find the ice gone. Despite the possibly bad omen, production from that point on was uneventful. In what would be Nolan's most famous driving tenet, practically everything is filmed in camera, with very little CG to be found. Although they did spend one day with real bats before promptly switching to digital ones. The film's most difficult hurdle was explaining the concept of a reboot to audiences. A word that hadn't entered the lexicon yet, even though comics have done it for years. How do you convey that Begins is not the origins of Keaton's Batman, nor the follow-up to Clooney's? Warner Brothers' strategy was to market the film unlike any of the others. Two-tone posters, a teaser trailer that felt like a horror film. And there is something out there in the darkness. Something terrifying. Something that will not stop until it gets revenge. Me. Then putting a heavy focus on the tank-like tumbler. Confirming this wasn't the sleek sports car version of Batman anymore. It was a hard-hitting action one. So what do you think? Does it come in black? Batman Begins swarmed theaters June 15, 2005. Eight years removed from Batman and Robin, audiences were still a bit hesitant, until the reviews poured in. The quick-cutting action isn't great, and non-Batman fans weren't amused with its exhausting equipment explanations, but the rest called it bold, absorbing, terrific, and easily the best Batman film made so far. Bale gave fans the layered, grounded Batman they've been waiting for, and the excellent cast around him was icing on the cake. It had a healthy box office opening, nothing cave shattering, but the word of mouth lifted it to a lofty 371 million worldwide. It may not have set the world on fire, nevertheless, Hollywood was never the same. From writing smart, faithful adaptations to the simple notion of rebooting a franchise, it inspired James Bond to get a new license to kill, Caesar to lead a revolution of apes, and Iron Man to become part of a bigger cinematic universe. Then the 2008 sequel, The Dark Knight, did set the world ablaze, making over a billion dollars and elevating comic book movies to serious award contenders. Christopher Nolan and his team set out to redefine the genre of a superhero film and ended up changing things forever. He also made The Dark Knight Rises. What are you doing for the next couple of months? You want to go to the same cafe in Italy with me every day and wait for my butler? <laughs>